and welcome to this week's episode of the Python People podcast, uh, where we share insights from technology leaders. And uh, my name is Guy Bevington. I'm the MD for True North Recruitment Group. And uh, this week, I'm lucky enough to be chatting with uh, David Hatchell. Uh, David, uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. Happy Friday. How are you? Uh, how are you doing today? Happy Friday. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, it's a nice Friday in... in, in... Well, it looks like a rainy day in London, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Get used to it. It's better than snow, isn't it? I guess. <laughs> uh, so you take take the not, not not better than Spain, where I'm from. So <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, right, don't, don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, David, it's an honour to have you on the show. Thanks for being here, and um, I guess by way of introduction uh, for those people that are yet to have the pleasure of, uh, of making your acquaintance. Um, you are a, um, a tech leader and entrepreneur, and uh, I think it's fair to say in recent years had a particular focus around the, uh, the health tech space uh, with companies like Orgy and, and, uh, and Bold Health, etc. And um, I guess sort of frame our, our chat in the episode today. So we, we had a good chat recently and we got talking about I guess the health tech landscape in general and uh, some quite interesting aspects within it, uh, specifically around the validity of, of business models in, in the health tech space and how you actually go about moving forward with an idea uh, in terms of assessing market fit. And uh, and also we talked a little bit around the ethics of, of the health tech space, yeah. well, which I think is uh, increasingly important in the sort of digital age that we we live in, uh, where people obviously um, you know, interact with content on a daily basis. And uh, so we thought, well, let's get together, let's do a podcast on it, and uh, and kind of here we are, I guess. So um, I'd like to start uh, as I as I start most podcasts by just inviting you to you know give a bit of your background, your career bio to date, and uh, yeah, we can go from there. Awesome! That sounds like a, a fantastic agenda. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm David. I'm originally from Spain and I spent the last uh, decade or so in the United States between New York and Boston doing education, but also uh, working at the same time. Uh, my original training was in mathematics. I did my undergraduate studies in New York in, in mathematics. Um, that was in the, the time where the word, the word uh, data science was becoming alive. Um, and so when I was, uh, you know, getting closer to graduation, I was thinking, of, you know, where I would like to work with data, uh, you know, a degree in mathematics without, you know, uh, a PhD, it's, uh, it's not a good, you know, career path, right? So data science was sort of the, the next best alternative for me. And, uh, and I ended up uh, thinking that finance would be a good place to start. There's great data, a lot of modeling challenges. And so I joined the bank uh, up in Boston after graduation, uh, where I spent about three years basically building statistical models to, to model different parts of, of, of the portfolios that the bank has. Um, I think at a technical level, that was a very exciting journey. Um, but at a cultural level, I, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, that was not what I really got me going, right? It was uh, sort of a very hierarchical, very um, um, conservative uh, sort of mindset, which is fine for the type of business, but it was not something that I was uh, enjoying as much as I would hope to. Um, and so I decided to go back to school um, and decided to essentially do a degree in, in, uh, in machine learning with a focus in health technology. So I went down back to New York City and got a master's in computer science with a focus on health technology. Um, and that's where I essentially developed uh, the technology behind Augie, which is a startup that we can talk a little bit about later, but a uh, startup that I ended up co-founding. Um, so yeah, that was a little bit the, the journey, right? The, I guess a little bit of more of a millennial journey where <laughs> I wanted more impact uh, in society and, and in general. Uh, that was sort of what drove that decision of, of switching to healthcare. It's, it's hard not to be motivated by problems in healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting you say the millennial journey, because I guess it's, uh, uh, yeah, I suppose historically that's always been the, the trend, hasn't it? Of, of millennials to kind of, you know, um, buck the corporate system and, and want to go something towards something that's kind of making an impact. But it's amazing actually how, as you know, we focus very heavily on the data science, uh, vertical as a business it's amazing how actually we're seeing that becoming more and more important to people on you know all, all age groups and, and all kind of backgrounds and and I think that's one of the beauties of data science as a particular industry is it's uh, 
it's an area of technology where you can actually genuinely see the impact of, of the, what you're doing you know, and, the, and, and the kind of the difference it's making within a business. Um, and I think that's kind Absolutely. of why, why it's become such a popular, um, uh, you know, sort of aspect of health tech, uh, you know, the data science and the kind of machine learning field and, and actually, especially within health tech of, you know, the kind of problems that you're solving and the, and the genuine impact, the positive impact it's having on people's lives. So, uh, yeah, I can fully understand why you, uh, why you moved away from finance to, uh, to go and, uh, save the world. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, talk us through then. You mentioned uh, you, you, you developed the technology for Augie. Um, yeah, do you want to give us a bit of background on some of the um, kind of technology you developed, some of the, the programs you've been uh, involved with and kind of what you're, what you're most proud of? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, Augie's uh, in- inception is, is certainly a very uh, fun story to tell because it sort of started as an accident. I... I had a several conversations with a, a group of physicians at uh, at the at the school uh, uh, the hospital, if you will, uh, a part of the school I was studying at, which was Cornell University in New York. Um, and uh, one afternoon, I had a very accidental conversation with a gastroenterologist, who uh, sort of jokingly mentioned how uh, his uh, uh, email inbox and 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 you know, SMS was full of stool images from patients that were sharing those, those pictures with, with him. Um, and sort of, he took it as a fun point uh, for me that really sparked the entire journey. It was the realization that, uh, you know, people are sharing those pictures which are very sensitive with, with the physician, hoping to get some information of value from it. Um, and so the whole idea became, how can we extract clinically valuable information from from search images. And that was essentially the idea behind Augie's. Augie's core technology is essentially computer vision uh, that characterizes human stool. And obviously this is critical for patients that have uh, uh, digestive conditions, so chronic gastrointestinal conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, chronic constipation, um, even inflammatory bowel disease, right? And so um, this idea that there is value in waste uh, was sort of what, what got the journey started. Uh, and obviously, from from there on, it, it became a, a bit of a uh, interesting journey because uh, the biggest problem we had is that there was no data set uh, that we could use to to train, uh, if you will, um, our our uh, machine learning models. Um, so we had to create one, um, and we had two options. One is to spend months collecting a data set and not being able to properly de-risk our journey. Um, so that was option number one. Option number two, which I'm very proud <laughs> that we took that decision at the time, was to try to um, simulate the data set. Uh, we essentially spent the weekend uh, using Play-Doh to make stool samples and create a, if you will, a synthetic data set that we used to uh, pitch for competitions, to um, get interest from the uh, medical community. And that really helped us a lot gain uh, terrain and, and just de-risk the entire journey early on rather than wasting months and months of collecting data for uh, for what was a very risky path, obviously. <laughs> so, Genius. <laughs> I'd love to have been a fly on the wall for that session. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was certainly a very fun, uh, a very fun process. Um, I think that one of the things that, that is important in, in that journey is that it all started as an academic process. So at the beginning, we we weren't thinking about what is the economic upside or what is the economic value proposition of, of such a product. We just assume that because it is clinically valuable, that then it can be also economically valuable. And those tend to correlate, but it's not a given. Mm. And so I think that that's where we started a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the focus uh, very early on, uh, trying to understand who could buy the technology, who would be a buyer of this technology. Um, and that obviously assumes that we want to make a startup out of it. Um, there are other ways to put that project out there uh, that are not a startup. You could uh, make it a nonprofit. You could remain in academia. Um, but for us, it was uh, clear that we wanted to, to start a company. And, uh, you know, we, we started uh, essentially a very disciplined process of who could be the buyer. Um, and I'm happy to go in detail about it, but that was essentially uh, where we spent a lot of our time. Um, and we ended up actually deciding to go direct to the consumer. Uh, and uh, there was a very clear um, opportunity there, uh, which was 
to help patients uh, experiment in a more structured way. So if you're a patient with a condition like irritable bowel syndrome, you will spend a lot of time experimenting with diets, with meditation, with supplements, and so on and so forth. And so that's a very unstructured process. And what we realized after talking to dozens of patients was that that process can be improved significantly with more structure. Um, and obviously using our computer vision tool to measure the outcome. And so that's essentially what, what we propose to the to our users or uh, our customers, if you will. Uh, basically, a tool that helps you self-experiment in a faster and more efficient way. So you understand what works and what doesn't when it comes to lifestyle and dietary choices, mm. if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So yeah, let me stop there in case you have any questions. But I think that that was sort of the, the initial dates. No, it's really, really interesting. And I love the story and how it came about, you know, just sort of a casual conversation and you, you clearly, you know, twig, twigged an idea in your mind and sort of followed your nose. And I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great, uh, you know, it's a great hallmark of a, uh, an entrepreneur, I guess, isn't it? Somebody that sort of spots the opportunity. And, and yeah, I was really interested in what you were talking there about the, um, you know, understanding the, uh, the business model. And I, I guess that's particularly important in something like health tech isn't it because there's there's clearly lots of reasons why you potentially would want to start a health tech business you know just from purely down to the you know the like say the positive impact and the altruistic you know nature of the business you know you kind of think well obviously it makes sense if we can you know start a business in in this field and solve this condition for somebody um but i guess there is this other side of the coin like you said unless you're a you know a not-for-profit or you're a you're a charity or you're you know in research a business has to have a customer doesn't it? It has to have someone that's going to buy the product and and i guess there is always that fine line in particularly in the health tech space of understanding okay well you really got to assess the business the validity of the business model and actually does does this make sense to to build a product in this space are people going to buy it is the business actually going to to be able to sustain itself and uh, that's a really interesting point you raised about you know understanding which sort of temp target demographic you were going for and like say to the consumer and also the, the angle, I guess, of how you sort of um, broach the, the, the product. So like I say, from a, an experimentation point of view, that's, that's really interesting. But uh, did you go through other kind of, in terms of that process of, you know, for anyone else, that's kind of in that stage of, of, of formulating a, a health tech business, you know, how, how did that process work as far as the consideration of the, the validity of the business model? And did you consider other avenues before you sort of thought, okay, this is a quite an interesting angle directly to the consumer? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think that uh, first time founders uh, always fall into very, um, you know, frequent traps. Um, and for us, uh, it was the idea that we were pushing our technology to market, but we hadn't spent the time uh, really trying to understand the market uh, well enough and validating these ideas. And so we were sort of doing both at the same time. And that was not something I, I think we did well, uh, something that I, uh, I've seen so many other entrepreneurs, especially first time entrepreneurs uh, do, but obviously it's something that one should try to avoid. It's very hard to, to, to go against that intuition. Um, but one thing that we did, um, I think pretty well is uh, validating um, our different uh, potential markets, our different potential buyers um, in a very quick manner. So for instance, I'll give you an example. We started with, um, um, how our tool, our technology could uh, serve clinical trials where stool is one of the outcomes for that clinical trial. So we spent basically three or four weeks uh, talking to whoever we could in the pharma industry that makes or is researching products in the, in the lower GI sort of therapeutic area, if you will. Um, and, and also just mining data from clinicaltrials.gov in the US and there's other resources here in Europe as well. Um, but just really trying to quantify how big is the opportunity. Let's assume that the technology works. Let's assume that it's valuable. How big is the opportunity? And so doing that very quickly is very important. There is a pretty good idea of what's a sweet spot. You, you typically want to be in a market that is, you know, two to four billion dollars annually, right? So that's, that's sort of the sweet spot you want to be in. It's not too big. It's not too small. Um, but if you want to be a, you know, VC backed uh, sort of startup, you need to be in that range because the uh, sort of the the calculation that the investor does is, uh, you know, assuming that you're going to be five to ten percent successful, uh, how likely are you to be a unicorn, right, uh, in your market? And so it has to be large enough uh, for you to be a unicorn in that market, but not, not too large or not too small. 
if it's too large, you probably did something wrong in your calculation. And if it's too small, then it's not a, um, a worthy opportunity for an investor. And that's why it's a very important question to answer. In the beginning is, do you want to build a startup? Because if you do, you need to find that, that market. Otherwise, you can do other things. And that's completely fine. But just so you know, that's important to consider from the beginning. So coming back to the main point, the, um, um, you know, the pharma space, we quickly realized that it was not big enough. Uh, in the US, there is about three to 400 trials in lower GI space. So you would have to charge an astronomical amount of money for your technology uh, to actually make it a, a, a profitable market. Um, and it wasn't that big enough. And more than that, our value proposition to those clinical trials was not big enough to make that a big market. So we quickly ditched that idea and we moved on to, to other ideas. So we, uh, we definitely spent time exploring the um, the clinical decision support so how our tool could integrate into electronic health records and electronic medical record systems uh, to support the decision making of the physician that was something that we examined uh, it's a very very um, hard place to go into because integrating into health systems takes a very long time and you have to understand that this is the united states where it's not like you have you know a single payer systems it's it's an incredible mess of of uh, of a market um, uh, so that we quickly ditched that one. Uh, we spent some time in the employer, um, employee benefit, which is a very interesting market, a crowded one, but certainly a very interesting one where there's a lot of, uh, of these digital health com companies going to, we'll, we can talk about that later, but that's, that's really a very attractive market, uh, which has a lot of complexity, especially how do you prove to the employer or the payer in general that you can reduce the cost for them? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, and so that's why we ended up considering the consumer. We, we, we saw that um, their early adopters, uh, you know, we don't have to spend a year trying to sell to a big customer. We can sell uh, to a user in a small amount of time. Um, and we could test out, obviously, whether or not our product is valuable to the end user um, with the idea that we would find an economic buyer later on that would be different from the consumer. That was sort of the, the grand vision that we had. Um, and I think that the, the very important point here is that all these big assumptions that I'm telling you, we built experiments to test them. And I can give you some examples of those, but I think that it's a very important idea. Uh, where, is the, where is the big risk? Um, what kind of innovation are you building? Um, and understanding you know, what the big assumptions you're making are uh, and trying to uh, Build experiments, not products, experiments to test them and quantify them is a very important way of thinking, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that is really interesting because I guess, you know, all entrepreneurs start out with an idea, don't they, like you said, and, and I guess any business is always, and I'm relating this back to, to, to True North, you know, you kind of start in one direction, you've got such belief and volition in, in that idea, and then all of a sudden, you know, because I guess really any any even if you've done your due diligence, any kind of startups always a, a guess as to how it's going to obviously perform. And you've got to always do this, this do an adapt approach, I guess, in a series of pivots along the way. And, and sometimes where you end up isn't always where you necessarily thought you would at the beginning of the journey. But um, what I really like about what you said there is clearly they sounded like quite a considered, almost scientific approach, you know, from these experiments that you were using as to how you were justifying the next steps and, and whether you would, you would look to pivot or not. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that. How did how that process look? Yeah, I think that I, I would typically summarize that by the term discipline entrepreneurship, the idea that you, you know, you, you, you follow that almost scientific process, as you said, to, to de-risk the entire operation. Right. Um, so for us, one of the biggest assumptions, once we decided, um, uh, uh, to go direct to the consumer was is this valuable to consumers you know we had this big assumption big hypothesis that uh, patients struggle uh, experimenting on their own um, they need a, a, a tool that helps them do that quicker and faster that way they know whether they can eat this or do that and, and not be bothered by symptoms and things like that um, and we essentially, instead of building a complex product and spending months doing so, and I don't know, thousands and tens of thousands of, of you know, pounds or dollars in this case, uh, we spent basically a weekend creating a, an SMS uh, tool where it was us behind it. Uh, and we recruited, I think it was something like 20 patients 
um, and we started delivering that solution manually. No software, well, just the software for, for the SMS part, um, but really a very rudimentary tool. Uh, we call it a concierge pilot. The idea that what you're trying to quantify there is, is this valuable to people? Um, and you don't need a big group for that. You need a small group. You don't need to build an app for that. You can do it manually, even over the phone or email, you could deliver that product, right? And I think that that's an important practice. I've seen a lot of great entrepreneurs do sort of that idea of concierge pilot. Um, and in the end, what you're, what you're testing basically is, um, will people pay for it? And so we started sending uh, you know, bills <laughs> and people were paying for it, right? And so that was our realization. Okay, so there is value here. If people are paying for it, that, that's a pretty strong signal that the product and the, uh, and the features that we're delivering um, are valuable to the consumer. Um, the next question became, uh, how big is that? Like how much, how valuable is this at a scale? Um, in other words, and, and this is more of the financial terminology, if you will, lifetime value, which means how much value can you extract from a single customer? And that's a very, very important metric um, mm -hmm. in, in the startup, well, in general, for any business really, is that can you extract more value from your customers than what it costs you to acquire or serve one, right? Uh, in the software world, serving has no cost because software is really uh, efficiently scalable, but acquiring those users can cost money through advertising and other meetings, right? Um, so the big assumption we had is, well, the, the, one, the one number we wanted to calculate is, what is this lifetime value that we can extract? So we essentially paused the entire pilot we had. We uh, spent a month and a half or so building a scalable version of that pilot, meaning software. So we built an app for that. Um, and we recruited about 300 patients. Uh, and we run an experiment for three months, really trying to understand for how long are people going to find our service valuable? Um, and that's basically what we, you know, the, one is the value assumption, the other one is the scale assumption. Is this how, how easy is it going to be to go to market? How efficient is it going to be? Um, and that's a very important question to, to answer uh, as soon as you can, yeah. especially in consumer products, especially in consumer products where I think that it's very, very different from the B2B space where, um, you know, value propositions can be quantified more easily, right? Mm. It's either some revenue um, uh, driver or it's some cost reduction tool. Yeah. Uh, and you can put a number to that. It's, it's fairly easy to calculate. In the consumer space, um, the, the, I think the way the consumer reasons about things is uh, way more complex. I'm not going to say rational or not ra rational. I don't like that distinction. I think the consumer is rational, but it's way more complex, higher dimensional sort of yeah. um, decision making process. And it's way harder to quantify. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I've had, had relatively limited exposure to the B2C space, but I do, yeah, fully in summary coming from that front. And I think, it, you know, I always look at it like from a B2C um, business model, essentially you're, you're asking somebody to part with their hard earned cash, you know, that's, that's post tax, you know, it's what they've got left over at the end of the month and they, they've got to see the value in, in the, in the proposition. And, uh, and like you said, I, I think the, the longevity element of things, I mean, I love, I love the, the, the pilot experiments you spoke about there. And I think it's just such a sensible way to, to, to do it. Um, and I'd be really interested to actually, you know, it's, it's actually the first time I've, I've spoken to a, uh, you know, kind of a health tech entrepreneur that's sort of taken that level of sort of meticulous approach to it. But, um, but no, I think it, clearly there's a, a strong underlying level of business acumen going throughout, um, you know, the way you were approaching um, the, the business, which is, which is great. Um, but I guess onto that B2C element of things, I think when it comes to, you know, like we said, we're, we're asking people to part with their, their, their cold, hard cash for, you know, a product or a service in something like health tech and um, where it's, it's something that really people, yeah, I'm sure do a whole lot of value in if, if, um, you know, they, they kind of see the validity in, in the service. Um, do you feel that comes with an extra level of probably an even greater sort of consideration around um, ethics and accountability and being, you know, because essentially it's such an, a, an emotive and emotionally charged uh, thing. You know, people aren't necessarily going out there to, to, to pay for these services for fun, I guess, are they? They're going out there because they genuinely need something. They need that value and, and need that insight. Um, so how do you, um, yeah, how do you ensure as a, a health tech business that there, there is that level of accountability to 
uh, to consumers at the end. And uh, yeah, I guess just what, what are your sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. I think that let me unpack it into two different portions there. Um, I think the first thing I'll say is that uh, if you're trying to build a startup in, in the consumer health space, um, it's a hard journey. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons I think it's hard is um, from a behavioral perspective, uh, it typically requires the user or the patient to invest effort, cognitive load, or some sort of way, right? So if you're asking the patient to perform experiments or, uh, or document data, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. You're asking for a lot of homework on the patient side, and we did that, and a lot of these, these products in the consumer health space do that. Um, and you have to realize that unless your value is as immediate as possible and as apparent as possible, it's very hard to, to motivate the, the patient or the user to keep doing the thing that you want them to do. I'll give you an example. So headaches. If you have a headache, um, there's a great solution for that. You have pretty much everyone has at their home bare aspirin, right? Uh, you take it, 30 minutes, it's gone. It's noticeable, it's fast, it's gone, it's valuable. It's easy to, for the consumer, or my son, you know, the human, to realize that value. Um, there's other products in consumer health where you're saying, you know, for a number of days or weeks, uh, you're going to do something, and maybe there is some value if you do this for a decade, how is that good? <laughs> That's a terrible business, but so many products fall in that category, right? And we were one of those where, you know, we were asking um, individuals to perform experiments on their, on their own, very structured, you know, uh, very quantifiable experiments. Uh, but yet we're asking, in our case, it was two week experiments, uh, you know, invest all this effort into complying with the experiment uh, procedure that we're asking you. Um, and then maybe you have some good or maybe not good news at the end of the, of the experiment, right? That's a terrible thing, right? And, and obviously from a clinical perspective, it's ideal. From a behavioral and compliance perspective on the individual side, it's not. Mm. Um, and that's such an important thing to understand when you're building this. You're gonna struggle with compliance. I think a lot of these companies fail when their business model um, needs to be aligned with patient compliance, but patient compliance is very hard to do, to get, mm. basically. So that's yeah. the first thing I'll say. Mm. Um, in terms of accountability, I think that uh, that's a bit of a separate question. Um, but in general, I think that there is the world of regulated products, and that's pretty well covered, right? So the, the drugs that are being FDA or MHRA approved, uh, and so on and so forth, that takes care of that accountability, right? That's why that system is in, in, in place. Um, but there's obviously a lot of stuff, especially in digital health and, and in the supplement. Um, supplement industry, if you will, where, uh, pardon the term, but there's a lot of snake oil, right? It's a lot of big promises and, and, and not necessarily clinically validated. Like you really want to make sure that what you're, what you're offering is safe and effective. Those are, that's why you have clinical trials, but there's a lot of products that don't need to go through that process. Um, and I think that there is a lot of brands out there that um, really take that seriously and have been lucky enough to be to have been able to interact with two of them. So I'll, I'll give them as an example. I think the first one is um, uh, Seed Health. So Seed Health is a company that recently acquired um, Augie, um, which is a company I, we were talking about earlier. And uh, it's a company, it's a microbial science company, basically. Um, they, they do research in different areas uh, everything related to microbes and how microbes can be uh, used for uh, betterment of human and, and planetary health, if you will. Those are big words, but it's true. That's that's what they focus on. Um, <laughs> one of their first products is a very fancy uh, probiotic and uh, prebiotic, uh, really destined to improve gut health. Well, that's one of the things that 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 it's uh, there for. Um, but obviously, if you look at the market of probiotics, there's a lot of probiotics out there. Um, and very little um, clinical evidence that they actually do what they're supposed to do. Mm. So one of the things I, I, I love about uh, Seed Health is that 
they actually spend the time and the money, they make an investment in that accountability to the consumer. The idea that they understand that going through clinical validation, even if it's not uh, necessary, um, is a very good competitive practice, right? Um, and to give an example, their probiotic, we actually, as, as part of our collaboration and obviously uh, acquisition, we help them build uh, the software that supports a clinical trial they're running at the at Beth Israel, which is a part of the Harvard um, hospital system. Um, and we were a part of, of, of that, and, and which, which was a fantastic uh, uh, and insightful journey. Um, but that's just one example. The other example I say is um, in the world of digital therapeutics, and this is um, also an example of a company where I worked at called Bold Health, which is a London-based company, a digital health company, that essentially makes uh, digital therapeutics for, for gut health. And uh, I think that something similar happens in the, in the digital therapeutics world, by the way. And I don't know if people are familiar with the word digital therapeutics. It's a very fancy term. It just means uh, therapies that typically work in the clinic. You package them up in an app, uh, which has content, um, exercise, and so on and so forth. And, and you can distribute that to a lot of people, right? Uh, in a scalable manner. That's what digital therapy is. It's nothing more. <laughs> I, would, I would have had a good guess, but thanks for explaining. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so Bull Health makes these digital therapeutics. Um, the first product is called Zemedy. It's for irritable bowel syndrome. And it really went through the trouble to go through clinical trials. So both helped run a, um, a, um, a randomized clinical trial, an RCT, at the University of Pennsylvania in, in the US, uh, really trying to prove the efficacy of their product uh, on, on patients. And I think that's another example where, where that level of accountability, even if you don't need it uh, from a regulatory perspective, is a fantastic um, tool, both on the ethical side, but also uh gives you a competitive edge if that makes sense yeah it does absolutely and um i totally uh I totally understand where you're coming from that front and i think especially in the health you know when you think about supplements vitamins that kind of thing yeah, the, the, the the marketing element of that is just absolutely huge and and being able to you know and, and i think that's a, a very uh um yeah honorable thing that that sees do like you say and i think it is ultimately from a market competitive point of view it also does stand you apart but i think it's a it's a great thing when companies do go out of their way to have that level of accountability and due diligence to the end consumer because uh i know for a fact and you know my, my other half will probably shoot me for saying this but i know for a fact she's kind of like a salesperson's dream when it comes to anything to do with like you know <laughs> these like uh vitamin products or whatever out there and i'm like you have absolutely no proof these things work whatsoever and, and you know, i look into it and they haven't really been you know, tested and it's very difficult to prove but um but yeah, I think businesses that do do that, you know, um, yeah, are certainly set for fair weather moving forward because there is such a, you know, a rise. Like I say, in digital therapeutics at the moment, there is such a rise in so many companies out there that, um, you know, are going into this space. And I think going back to your point earlier about being able to prove value early on to people, um, you know, is is absolutely key. Um, and yeah, before I go on to my my next question related to that, firstly, well done on the acquisition. That's a very uh, uh very very proud moment and uh so you must be very Thank proud you. of <laughs> yes yes uh, i mean we were very lucky to to be able to do that uh in the middle of covid uh to be able to to go through the entire acquisition process um i think that that was that was perhaps one of the the, the points that i think we, we did well um you know that's that's very important and uh uh yeah <laughs> good, good on you yeah there's, there's not many people yeah. could uh yeah could say that during the last 12 months that you know been able to successfully um yeah go through an acquisition so yeah fantastic great well work. we can talk about that because i think that um you know even if it's covid i think that uh in general activity in the health technology space digital health space has really gone uh you know has risen uh, significantly uh, during COVID, uh, as a mm. result of COVID, in, in, in fact, I would say, and we can talk a little bit about that. But um, I'm, I, to some extent, I'm not surprised that these, you know, that there is M and A activity and that there is venture investment mm. that is happening during COVID in in in, in health technology. 
Yeah, certainly in health tech, absolutely. Yeah, I guess that's a very, a very good point. Um, but uh, yeah, just to go back to my previous question before we go on to that, I think that's a really good uh, topic to discuss. Um, but when we were talking about the value proposition and, and kind of people seeing the, um, the value in the service, uh, how, what impact do you think that has from a, a relationship point of view with the end consumer? I guess from kind of a, a customer acquisition versus customer retention point of view. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on how quickly that value needs to be seen and, and ultimately what impact does it have on the, I guess, the longer term relationship with a, with a consumer? That's a fantastic question. I think that it's also a big question. <laughs> so I'll do my best here, but I think that I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit. The first thing is, um, I go back to the question I said, to, to, the, to the matter I said earlier, which is if you're building something, uh, make sure you understand what, what type of uh, company, if it's a company or a nonprofit or academic project you want to build. Uh, how you answer that question will matter a lot in what you do after that, right? Um, uh, a, a lot of times I see physicians who, uh, you know, just for, for, for the betterment of their, their patients, they, they want products to exist uh, and they jump out and build those products, but they, they don't consider whether or not that should be, that can actually be funded by venture money. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times it's not, and just because you know there is some level of requirement that is very high um, for a startup to be to be funded in that in that kind of environment. Um, so that's the first question. Second question, I think that typically you want to be the aspirin for that headache. You don't want to be a vitamin that maybe in forty years will save you two years of life, right? It's mm -hmm. that's the problem with the supplement uh, space is that. You know the the value is perceived, if at all, very far down the line, um, and that is that is another thing. You want to be the aspirin yeah. <laughs> if you can be the aspirin. Um, and I think that uh, another point important that I think is important is the idea that um, how your um, it, it, many times in, in healthcare, I think that the the user, the end user, and the economic buyer are two different entities, right? The, the end user could be the patient, if you will, uh, but the buyer of that, the economic buyer, could be a, you know an insurer, a employer, um, a health system, or pharma company, right? Um, you want to make sure that the incentives are aligned there. Um, a lot of times, you see, for instance, I, I was talking to an entrepreneur uh, a couple of weeks ago who wanted to build. A um, essentially a, a tool for 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 patients in a particular therapeutic area, uh, and he wanted to monetize it through advertising. Um, and I I made the observation, and I hate to be prescriptive, but in this case, I, I thought it was important to mention that on one side, he's trying to make a tool for the patient to be as low touch as possible, meaning. You know, you use it in a very specific point in time. But on the other side, you're saying, I make money from advertising, mm. which depends on the person spending the more time, the better on the, on the service or platform. Uh, those two are completely opposite. Mm. Your end users' incentives are opposite to your, uh, to your economic buyer, and you're going to have a very hard time making those work. <laughs> mm. How do you build a product that works that way? <laughs> um, so understanding those you know, those incentives is, is a very important thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I think that, that with you. <laughs> what's that? So I bet they were glad they had that conversation with you. Well, I, again, I don't try to be prescriptive, but I, I tend to speak to a lot of entrepreneurs and, and, uh, um, I, I see all of these gaps in reasoning that I, again, I'm not trying to be prescriptive. I'm just trying to point, um, a specific hole in the reasoning that needs to be answered. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I wish someone, I mean, we had a lot of support in our network when we were starting Augie. Uh, but, you know, the, the more people get hands on with you and help you understand these, these problems, it's important. The last thing I wanted to mention is um, you need to understand what's the core innovation you're building. A lot of times, I, again, I, I listen to entrepreneurs and they're like, oh, we're going to make a product that has this feature, this feature, this feature, this feature. Uh, they're just 
enumerating a list of features, right? Um, but they're not telling me what is what is the core uh, value proposition, what is the core innovation. Um, and innovations can happen in many places, right? It can happen at the technology level, like Klaus Sarogi. It can happen at the service level um, of how you deliver care, for instance. Telehealth solutions uh, typically fall in that category. Uh, Babylon Health is a great example of that. Um, you know, they're not doing care differently. There is no particular technology that they have invented. They're using existing technology, right? Um, they're really improving the service in a significant manner, right? How you access a GP in the UK, for instance. Mm. Um, you can also have channel level innovations, right? And that also works well. Um, there's a very important company in, in New York called the Row, Row Health. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, yeah. It's a company that started uh, essentially doing um, um, hair loss and erectile dysfunction uh, medication very accessible to to the male population um, it was everything was prescribed online it was shipped to you in a very discreet manner and so on and so forth um, that's a great innovation because the stigma that a man has going into a pharmacy and buying you know hair loss or or, or erectile dysfunction is big and mm -hmm. so the value that you can do that easily from an app is big right so understanding what your value is and Define your product around it. Start with that. Test that value proposition of that core innovation. Don't add 50,000 features just to embellish um, because that's not going to give you the real, uh, that's going to allow you to test the real value proposition. You can do that later on, right? So all those things that you add around the product, all those peripheral features help you uh, improve retention uh, or some other KPI down the line. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, I think that there is, you need to, to the bare bones, the, the, the core piece needs to be the one you test, nothing else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And it's, uh, again, you know, just listening to that, one of the things I, uh, you know, I love about your approach is it's it's very kind of, I mean, a lot of what you've just mentioned now, I guess that's not necessarily wholly specific to the health tech space. I mean, just, just listening to when you were talking, you know, I can see a lot of parallels there that actually extrapolate out to recruitment you know, in the world that, that we're in. You know, when you think about kind of what makes a, a successful recruitment organization and it's, there's all these different tweaks and changes that you can, you can make and really understanding how you're innovating and, and is it at a technology level, you know, from automation, you know, reach, is it actually at a service delivery level, like you said, you know, or, or is it even kind of a yeah, so distribution and channel level? So it's uh, very, uh, yeah, very uh, sobering food for thought. Um, but um, yeah, I guess um, I'd like to just sort of close by going back to the point you were making earlier about, you know, the last sort of 12 months, the impact it's had on, uh, you know, health tech. And, and I guess it's something that is now becoming very prominent. And, uh, you know, I was, I was tuned into a webinar the other day that, um, for a business where they were talking about the, the rise in health related apps um, over the last six months, um, you know, I think it's, it's sort of up, it's gone up 25% from 4 million to 5 million downloads a day for kind of digital therapeutic apps, which, um, you know, clearly showing a trend that everyone's taking their health a bit more seriously, uh, I guess for, for relatively obvious reasons. Um, but, um, but yeah, how do you, how do you see the, the landscape for health tech and, um, you know, for 2021 and, and beyond? Um, how do you kind of see it shaping up? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm no health economist, and I'm not going to claim exhaustive knowledge on this matter. <laughs> but um, I'll give you my my bird's eye view from from my place. Uh, so I think it, it's true that I think everyone is talking about how COVID has propelled um, the digitalization and decentralization of health uh, in in big numbers, right? So I think that um, we're talking about it, right? So venture investment is is keeps growing and, and grew during um, during uh, the 2020 year. Um, the strong money activity, the one I can think of is uh, uh, Teladoc acquisition of of, um, of Libongo in the US, which was a was one of these digital health players as well, very big one. Um, but I think that. You need to, if you, if you were to unpack that and where are the areas where I think that there is most excitement and perhaps also from the investor perspective, um, I would perhaps mention the following. Um, the first is at-home testing, this idea of at-home diagnostics, this idea of being able to um, 
to identify the issue and the patient uh, clearly and as cheaply as possible from home. Um, there's also a lot of investment and a lot of excitement in the uh, R&D of drugs and therapeutics. I think that especially companies that use AI for uh, for improving that process, uh, I think notably Benevolent AI, yeah, which I think is based in Boston, in London, yeah. uh, is yeah. one company that that uh, also has some presence in New York as well. But you know that that partners up with pharma companies and helps them uh, come up with candidates uh, for for drugs that have higher likelihood likelihood of success. Um, that's a very exciting place, um, and also anywhere that has to do with improved ways of care delivery and therapy delivery, right? So. Obviously, all the permeation of telehealth, we've seen that every company that we could think of has a COVID chatbot and will try to build something on top of that, right? Um, there's also the sort of the digital pharmacies, right? Uh, I'm not sure how that worked in the UK yet, but at least in the US, you have PillPack, uh, which was acquired not that recently, but uh, by Amazon um, and the same company, Row Health, that I was mentioning earlier, started a digital pharmacy. Um, you know, they have already infrastructure for the hair loss and erectile dysfunction that, that I mentioned earlier. And so they, they realized that it was a big opportunity to just digitalize pharmacies, right? Um, and, and finally, this one is really exciting that I, I was reading about a few weeks ago, is there's a couple of services now that are doing, um, that are creating APIs for care providers. So let's say that you want to have a nurse go somewhere, like draw blood on someone. Uh, there are APIs for that. It's crazy. Like, who knows that you can build an API that sends a nurse somewhere and then that is a large enough market. And that's that's amazing to me. It's sort of the Uber for nurses, uh, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, and so I think that, that goes to say that I think most of these, these technologies, if you think about what their value proposition is, it's really reducing cost in some meaningful manner, right? You're reducing cost in... In, by doing at-home diagnostics, you're reducing costs by um, uh, identifying higher likelihood uh, success candidates for drugs. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a very complex value chain in healthcare, especially in places like the US. Um, so any improvements in terms of how you deliver therapies, how you deliver care um, are very meaningful. So I think that that's where the, the focus seems to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some really interesting uh, insights there into the different areas of the market. I mean, I, I am always amazed when I do come across health tech companies as to the, you know, the, the approach they have and the angle. And I guess just yeah, going back to um, uh, your 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 business earlier that you were talking about, you know, in terms of just there's so many amazing applications of how technology can be used in the in the health tech space. Um, yeah, I certainly think this this home diagnostics element that you spoke about um you know i think that's just going to be you know very very important moving forward with you know especially where we are at the moment people being at home sort of um i guess a lot of people sort of very reticent to leave the house unless they really have to um yeah. you know i think that's a really big area of the market moving forward but uh but no i mean I, to be honest though, it's been really really fantastic chat i've i've really enjoyed speaking to you and i personally have taken a huge amount of value out of this actually and uh thank you very much for uh, uh for being here with us today and uh, and sharing uh, your wealth of knowledge and um yeah I, I very intently will follow your progress moving forward and uh can't wait to see what your next big uh next big technology idea is any are you giving anything away anything in the pipeline or <laughs> I'm working on an interesting idea, but it's a bit early to to discuss it. It has to do with uh, the R and D process, so that's all I can say at the moment. But cool. uh, it's a bit early. We'll see. Cool. Well, Thank I'll, you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. No worries at all. Thank you, and uh, yeah, stay safe, and look forward to catching up soon. Likewise. Bye for now. Bye.